Welcome to the podcast. Today we have episode two in this little series on golfer's elbow or really what I should call medial or lateral epicondylitis. Phil's probably going to correct me later on the naming, but this is a deep dive into golfers and tennis elbow. We in the past episode spoke about the diagnosis, the importance of diagnosis, and really the difference between a, a golfer's or tennis elbow and other acute sort of style injuries like a, a tendon muscle or cartilage tear or, or something like that. Um, this is a really, really important conversation for anyone who's into any sort of sport that requires a gripping, golf, tennis, throwing sports, even a combat sports where you're snapping the elbows, and also people that are into gym training, CrossFit, anything like that. You're going to love this. Golfer's elbow or tennis elbow can be a terrible injury if you don't know how to rehab it properly. And today we're really going to take a deep dive into going beyond the diagnosis and talking about how to actually rehab it, where this is the the rubber meeting the road, metaphorically speaking. So strap yourself in. Welcome to our podcast, proudly brought to you by VPA Australia, our trusted supplement provider since Unity Gym started. As sponsored athletes, we're excited to offer you a special 10% discount on top quality supplements that ship worldwide. Just use our discount code from the description. To avoid international shipping fees, contact VPA and tell them we sent you to get a flat shipping rate. Today's episode is also sponsored by the Flexibility Blueprint. Ever felt lost in the sea of social media fitness advice? The Flexibility Blueprint is your map to progress, designed to help you get laser focused on what matters most for your journey in flexibility and strength. And guess what? It's free. Grab it using the link in the description. If you're starting your flexibility journey, don't miss our 20 minute mobility routine. It's your first step to quick wins in flexibility. For those further along, use our Flexibility Masterclass, featuring advanced techniques like loaded stretching and end range strength for the pancake, front splits, middle splits, and more. Links for both are also in the description. And for the seasoned athletes, avoid the frustration of complex training puzzles with our UMS Tribe membership. It's a different online coaching experience with strength and flexibility combined. Don't forget, we're Amazon affiliates too. You can find all the equipment used in our videos and podcasts at the most competitive prices with our affiliate links in the description. Now let's dive into today's episode. Welcome, Phil. Thank you for joining us again. Matt, I love it. It's what I want to do all day. I just want to talk to people like en masse and just tell them about injuries and want to hear feedback. Tell me to like be more concise, hurry up with the, <laughs> get to the point. Yeah. And I just want to like keep that going because it's just a nice time. So good. And it's so much better if you guys, if it's a two-way conversation. So put your comments in. If, if you're watching this on YouTube, then please, please, please let us know what you're dealing with. Let us know what your recovery is like. Let us know whether you're feeling like you're making progress. And also what the mechanism was, what what caused you golfers? Was it actually playing golf or was it uh, working out in the gym or was it a combination of both? Now, if you're listening on the podcast, I'd love it if you could give it a like and possibly a share and for both you know subscribe if you like this sort of content there's going to there's stacks of it and we do all sorts of injuries not just golfers elbow but to, uh, and today injury. yeah exactly yeah. and I, and I will, and I will just share that this this series came about from content that we produced then rad has gone ahead and off the back of that produced a deep dive into golfers elbow treatments and then we deep dive into his head all that day, I reckon. <laughs> That's right. And then off the back of that, we create the Golfer's Elbow Rehab Blueprint, which is an end-to-end strategy, really sharing our journey of how, how we overcame it. I did speak in the first episode about how we've all had it. And Phil even, we, we shared a story about how he gave it to himself to get some skin in the game and, and and prove a point, prove his thesis, which was pretty amazing. I watched it all. It all happened in Unity Gym. And uh, if you want, if you, if you missed the first episode, go back and watch the start of it just for that story because it's hilarious. Anyway, today we're moving on and we're talking about how to actually fix it. And, you know, one of the things that I think is super important, and we spoke briefly off camera about this, is that you can get very caught up focusing on the, you know, the, 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 you know, real important, I guess, localized area. Like you're looking at the elbow going, why is it hurting so much there? And, and, and what can I do? And we, we, we spoke about the risks associated with things like massage and stuff like that early on. It can be actually counterproductive. Also rest, taking time away, abstaining from exercise and, you know, stimulus resistance training can make things worse. It certainly did for me. 
So what I want to really emphasize today is that it was actually for me, for the second time that I got golfer's elbow, it was the the, the glo- looking at it from a macro perspective and fixing the whole sort of kinetic chain, like right through my arm from the gripping muscles, strengthening the gripping muscles, strengthening the forearm muscles in, in flexion, extension, supination, pronation, and also the scapular control and bicep and tricep for elbow flexion and extension. And, and really looking at that from a unit. So I really want you to share, Phil. And while you do, I'm going to try and fix my lighting because I do look really yellow here. <laughs> uh, why is it that that is so important? Let's yeah, kick it off there. You've covered, covered something really nice there. And I think it even goes one beyond that. So when thinking about like that really zoomed in, we're thinking, okay, at the specific tendon, which with what we're talking about here, we're talking about medial. Um, so the inside of your arm, all the flexors of your fingers and wrist come up and attach into what's called the medial epicondyle, which is why, why Yanni said medial epicondylitis, which as we talked about last time, be more correct if you said tendinopathy. But the like it's really tempting to get so zoomed in and think like, what's that one exercise that's going to fix that area and thinking like tendon, 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 what's happening like right at this particular point. And so that often leaves people then having a treatment approach, which is like, you know, load either loads of wrist flex exercises, lots of like treatment on the area itself via, you know, hands-on treatment into the forearms. And sometimes people go into like the electric shock kind of areas as well. And just being so zoomed in on, on the actual elbow itself. But it's so important to think about zooming out one level further, which is what Yoni's talked about there to like how the whole upper body system is working together. So that's when you think about systems, I like to think about like what are the kind of key compound movements or functional movements um, that use the elbow and, and, you know, in an exercise context, that's going to be the pushing, the pulling, the, and then, sorry, I've just got distracted by how I'm on, you look like you've been, um, had some like (laughs) iron deficiency issue. You've gone like a sepia tone. And I I also don't know why I've, I've, I've come up, I've appeared on the left side. (laughs) Yeah, We can easily fix that. There we go. But you are looking a bit on the yellow side, but that's all right. But what I was going to say is like when thinking about the functional movements in the gym, so pushing, pulling, but then also thinking about like other movements we do, like reaching, throwing all of that. It's not just a one joint movement. It's not just going to be, you know, elbow extension or flexion it's a combination of movements from our you know our scapula like axioscapula joint which is basically the the scapula on your rib cage then also your shoulder joint and then your elbow joint and your wrist joint and even your fingers so there's many joints at play and it's really important not to just to zoom in on what's happening at the elbow because you can go to town on like specific isolated movements and then re-aggravate your condition if you're getting the big picture movements incorrect and, and you know in the gym context that is you know looking at like and yoni has a bit of an anecdote to share i think about like pull-ups and how you know getting a bit of technique refinement on the pull-ups is a nice way of unloading the elbow by getting the shoulders more involved but there's really interesting stuff in throwing even just this like there's a great sort of story about how like this guy's shoulder injury was caused by a big toe extension issue where it's like when you can't rotate a pitcher in baseball couldn't rotate fully because his big toe was too stiff and, and painful to go into extension, he then had to use much more like upper body rotation and, and really wrench more through the arm instead of using that full kinetic chain to cause like the full body transfer of force and, and whip, which then means like overloading the shoulder because you got a big toe issue. So <laughs> sometimes things like that, I find really painful where people like, are like, oh, everything is connected in like, you know, and sometimes take that too far. But I think it's really important to both like respect and understand what's happening locally. So like really zoomed in on the tendon itself and the the specific joint system it's on, but then also zooming out and looking like how is the rest of your body and do you have good technique that's going to facilitate like, um, I guess specific, like loading that we can measure. Because if you have poor technique, it's really hard to be progressively overloading because if every time you do the movement, it's going to be t- entirely different. Sometimes you, for a pull-up example, like do it with your arms up by your, your shoulders up by your ears and you're really elbow dominant. Whereas sometimes you do, you know, other technique where you're using momentum and you're flying up and sometimes you're using your shoulders, then it's really hard to progressively overload because you've got so much variability. So getting your movement patterns right, understanding how the full system works together, but then having that awareness of that local, the zoomed out, and then one more zoom out again. If we think about like you as a human, there's some, like there's two factors. One is metabolically and upper body, upper limb tendinopathies do really seem to have a kind of stronger connection. It seems to like that sort of systemic inflammation side of things. So you can get all like the movement, right. But if you've got poor recovery or something metabolically <laughs> poor going on, you're going to be in a much harder place to kind of get past the tendinopathy because you do need to be 
you know, you got to remember exercise is a stimulus, but it's you actually get the res- physical adaptations in the recovery, which means good sleep, managing stress so your systemic inflammation is down, and then also managing from a nutritional side of things. Like if you're giving something stimulus, you need to give it also the resources to grow. So if you're undernourished, you're trying to lose loads of weight or something, and you're not having adequate protein and, you know, all the building blocks, then that's going to be a problem. But then one more step again is the mental side of things as well. And I think this is where it's so important to look at like, you know, not just d- doing the uh, the naughty corner rehab style that we talk about, which is like abstaining from all enjoyable training and just doing elbow like wrist flexions until you know <laughs> you're just so depressed you don't want to train again. It's, it's thinking like, how do I also feel like a functioning human that is capable and enjoying the training? Because again, when we talk about pain, it's so important to remember that it's like it's your body's perceived threat, and it's really hard to feel threatened physically when you're making great progress. So. In the blueprint there, there's some great, I saw some images there if you're watching the video of using things like parallettes or the, whatever the, what are the grip things called at the top? So these, they're, they're wrist, yeah, I've, I've actually head. got that exact pair at home here in my, yeah. in my training kit. And it, it, it is a steel hook that essentially yeah. dramatically reduces the amount of stress that you've got to take on the wrist. And I use them. They're very, they're very useful in bodybuilding because you get to a point, like for instance, at the moment I'm doing a 10 by 10 workout where I do a hundred reps of the prime, the two primary movements. And that to do a hundred reps on pull-ups is so hard. And it's taken me so much work to be able to act, even just hold the bar for that many reps of, yeah. of a pull-up, you know? And, and so there are times, for instance, Today I did a bench press and and my my workout was bench press and bent over row. Now on Wednesday I do boxing and 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 boxing is enormously stressful on the wrists and hands. So actually on my Thursday workout I put wrist straps on, which is just a bit of support on my wrist because otherwise it's just to manage load. Because coming off the back of boxing where I'm hitting heavy bags at at full tilt and really really going for it my hands are really sore and they need time to recover and i'm boxing again on saturday so the thursday workout at the moment i'm having to put just put a little bit of you know deloading the wrist a little bit in my bench press workout and my bent over row workout otherwise i'm likely to overload the the connective tissues in there and cause myself a little bit of strife so it's just all about yeah. that that's so, that managing yeah, so when you load, have those, you know, those tools to mean that you can still participate in the activities are actually, you know, one going to make the whole system stronger. So being able to still do your pull-ups because you've got that wrist support of doing the, you know, when you're grabbing onto the bar or for example, the parallettes are a really nice way of being out of that elbow flex. Um, so the grip in wrist extension, which then can be a compressive force on your forearms, which can make, you know, any pushing exercises intolerable. It means that you can like, while you're managing your tendinopathy, you can still like do the good stuff of strengthening the system, but you can also mentally enjoy your training still because you can still participate whether you're training on your own and like hit it, like working towards goals or you know a lot of the time it's just you know people in a group training situation like we had back when in unity gym when it was just such a beautiful community like you just didn't want to miss out on being there with the people you know and and, and seeing them and, and keeping those relationships going it's one of those things that can really un- like derail people's training is like if they lose that social connection because they can't participate in the workouts and then they stop going to the gym and then they, you know, just get into that downward spiral. So being able to use tools like is outlined in that blueprint is a beautiful way of dealing with the system, but also dealing with like the mental approach to keeping training. Cause when thinking about the pain science side of things, as we mentioned, part of it is your like metabolic system, which we've talked about, but also part of it is just your thoughts, mood, belief, context, and your ability to feel like you're not, I guess totally done and threatened. like your identity and your well-being isn't undone by the stupid elbow because the more you think about it the more you zoom in mentally on it then the more you'll be really like you'll experience the symptoms more and more and um that also then like with pain science there's this idea of sensitization which is basically like when you're really careful about something and you haven't loaded it for a long time then your body becomes like and your brain becomes like hyper aware of any signal coming from there. And so you see this a lot with amputees and that's why they have to often do like a sand into like buckets of rice with their fingers to like try and <laughs> desensitize the nerve endings. But the same thing can happen with forearm tendinopathy where, you know, even if you just bump it slightly on a, like on a wall walking past or on your body or like leaning on the side of the on your desk, like any amount of compression there, if you've been, you know, if it's really fed up, can be so sensitive. And we talked about in the last episode about compressive loading being an aggravating factor. And that's why we don't want to like, you know, hammer it with massage or hammer it with, um, you know, like a Theragun on there 
in the initial stages while it's angry. But if you leave it too long and you let, and it's still you know highly sensitized, then sometimes just adding in some level of like readapting it to compression and readapting your brain to deal with like the symptoms, sorry, stimulus there, getting into things like massage close to the area or the theragun can be a nice way of desensitizing as well. So you can see it's, you know, it is so multifactorial and there's going to be certain people who, you know, are really sensitive to compression, for example, whereas other people are going to be really sensitive to that tensile loading or the, or the grip. And so the joy of working with someone whose job it is to professionally like help you with this is we can kind of look at, okay, what are the most important factors for you and do away with the rest. And remember like it, it when you're thinking about how to, rehab injury it's all about getting your body back to what you want to be able to do and so the body is very specific about its adaptations and needs like gradual exposure and basically filling in the gaps from where you are to where you want to be and so that's where working with professionals is really nice for being able to i guess focus in on exactly the most important things for you but what you guys put together in the in that blueprint is showing like hey here's like everything you can do <laughs> and take you step by step so you can cover basically all the factors that that could be at play so Yes, that's right. Really and, and and that is that is important to point out, you know, there's not, nothing will ever compare to having a professional who's working with you specifically based on your needs and goals, you know, but, but you know, I mean, just caveat there, like there are plenty of professionals who will give you poor advice if we've talked about like ten, yeah. tendon, tendon pain is one of the most misunderstood injuries and particularly with like physios trained a long time ago who haven't kept up to date or or just other health practitioners, whether it's massage therapists or chiros or GPs or doctors, like it's just so misunderstood. So you can, as we, you know, you've experienced yeah, you, in the past, like got, get you pretty can bad really advice. Be yeah. And, yeah. and going back, you know, just to reiterate, the first time I got golfer's elbow really badly, I was told to rest at, at, for three weeks and then come back to training. And it was like three times as bad by the time I came back. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I yeah. think it went up by a factor of 100% <laughs> each week that I was away from exercise. Yeah. And that really changed. And but that would you know, appropriate management for um, like if that was a minor muscle tear that probably would have been fine, <laughs> but that's yep. the thing like tendons, like tendon injuries aren't muscle tests. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and then to reiterate again, what Phil was speaking about in the last episode, he rehabbed the injury using the same two exercises, the same, the same mechanism, which was, a pull, you know, pull-ups and bicep curls that he gave himself the injury just to prove that it is the loading variables that make the difference. It's not the yeah, exercise it's all about themselves. Yep. Now, what I, what I, from a strength and conditioning perspective, and this is where I can add a little bit of value here, is that what we have found over the years, and I've been training people since 2004, so for 20 years now, this is, this is recorded in 2020. Um, what we found was that prioritizing grip strength, forearm strength, elbow extension, flexion, I've and your sound. Is that me or you? Scapular control. I hope, I hope not. I, I can still hear myself. Sorry, I can't hear. Yeah, I'll just check if it's my. Sorry, everyone. It could be me. Okay, I'll, I'll keep going and see how we go. So, Sorry, um, the the what I was saying was we we found that during the early stages of one's training, we talk about technique optimization first, which is super important. And Phil and my and Rad's mutual friend Sebastian, our Australian strength coach, he is a powerlifting coach and strength coach, and he talks about it this, exactly the same thing. But he he talks about movement IQ, same thing. Fix the technique in the fundamental lifts, movement patterns, which is you know chest press or bench press, um, uh, uh, row horizontal row, vertical push pull, so shoulder press, pull up variations, squat, deadlift. Fix those fundamental lifts first. Get the technique optimization right. But then from a macro standpoint, strengthen the scapula control muscles. So the, the, the muscles that retract, that elevate, that depress the scapula and protract the scapula. Strengthen the muscles that bend and extend the elbow and strengthen the muscles that are controlling grip. So forearm muscles. And if, we, if you do that from a macro perspective, you will fix most issues. What is key and what Phil has made a, a good point of here is to get the dosage right, get the loading right based on if you've got golfer's elbow, the compromised area. So you're not going to go to the gym and still be able to stimulate your pull-up movement like you were prior to the exercise. You may even have to adjust the range of movement because it's all about getting that dosage right and making sure that we're not making the thing worse, we're making it better. And why don't you talk just to, you know, to finish up about what the experience is going to be like when you're rehabbing, you know, there's a, there's a, there's an, I guess a tolerance perspective here that you're going to experience some discomfort when you're working out. 
but we don't want yeah, to make so things keen. worse. So <laughs> let's let let let's let's finish up on that. So what would the experience be? The 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 actual exercises. I can't reiterate this enough, guys. The actual exercises are going to be quite specific to your needs. So you will need to either if you're doing it alone, you're gonna there's going to be an, an, a, a level of experimentation there. But if you get what we're about to talk about right, then. It, 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 you know, arguably you might have a, a lot of success, even if you don't have the guidance of an expert physical therapist, physiotherapist, or strength and conditioning coach like we give at Unity Gym. So let's talk about the loading variables and yeah. how you should feel after every workout. So just on that, like you said, it might be quite specific to you, but like really the beautiful thing about the body is that like we all have the same kind of fundamental movements. So you kind of can't go too wrong. And I think that's a like a, a trap that people fall into is looking for these kind of silver bullet ex like exercises that are just like wildly out there and different when really like most rehab comes down to like kind of understanding the fundamental movements, understanding like structural balance, and then applying it in a way that you're going to like be in that sort of adaptation to get the stimulus and then recover, not, get not stronger and it. adapt. Yep. But the, the thing is like when you're injured is, is figure out like, okay, what are the aggravating factors that, that cause this injury to be prolonged? And so that's where tendinopathy is so key to understand and where like the general advice with, and the general like kind of thing that most people are intuitive about with pain is thinking like, if it hurts, don't do it. And if it's like a lot of people think with pain is like, if it hurts, it means it's making it worse and it's damaging. When the really key thing to understand is like, you know, that's super helpful, like, intuitive advice when you're in a very like traumatic acute injury like a muscle tear like a bad bruise you know a, a acute ten like a ligament tear cartilage whatever like in the very early stages if, if you've had like something that really pisses it off that's great advice to you know just <laughs> stay away from the the painful thing but with tendinopathy it's it's a really important thing to understand is that like when you're dealing with it you need to actually work through some level of pain so the traffic light system is often kind of talked about with like, you know, um, zero, if we're thinking about pain on a zero to 10 scale, like zero, one, two, three being green light, orange light being four, five, six, and then the like red being seven, eight, nine, ten. 10, um, you know, there might be green up to four. Basically like we are happy with a, like a small amount of pain and you, you'll probably find like, as we've talked about before, it's often the first few reps with tendinopathy are like super painful and then it warms up and feels better so it's really common like if you start if you get going and you do a little bit you'll feel it really backs off but then people think like oh everything's fine i'm going to be all right and then just go like intense and just train right through it so the, the thing you want to do is like if you're feeling pain during the exercise you want it to be in that sort of zero to like four range and probably like ideally that sort of th like actually feeling like three or so because if you're doing it at a, like a really low intensity lightweight where you're getting no pain a lot of the time, you're not actually giving it enough stimulus to to signal that it needs to remodel and, and, and like send resources to that area. So we want to try and get that like, you know, two to three out of 10 pain generally when you're doing the exercise. But then it's that next day pain that then gives you the feedback about whether you've done too much or maybe even not enough. And so if you think about like having a baseline pain, and I think like a lot of people who've had tendinopathies for a long time, whether that's, you know, Plantar, plantar heel pain, plantar fascia, um, or uh, Achilles or hip or whatever, like you'll know that that kind of feeling of like, oh yeah, there it is every day. Like it's always there and sometimes it gets worse, sometimes it gets better, but there's that sort of baseline pain that you're generally aware of where it's like either first few steps, first few reps, it's typically always there. So you got to look at that as like your baseline pain. And then when you're doing the exercise, you're doing the loading, you again, it often feels better the more you do. But then if your baseline pain the next day goes up, then that's a sign you've probably done a bit too much from the day before. So the next time you go back to do the exercise, which isn't necessarily every day, and that's where people always fall into this trap with rehab, thinking you got to do rehab exercise every day. You don't. <laughs> you need stimulus, recovery, stimulus, recovery. So if you've got to then, you know, not freak out and think, okay, that was terrible. This makes it worse. Everything's bad. You got to just be like, okay, that's information. Now I've got data <laughs> and I got to look back. What did I do the day before? What was likely the most, you know, intense loading? Um, and then see if next time you do it, if you can just bring that back a little bit and retest. And so if you're then feeling the baseline pain being either the same or maybe even ideally, you know, slightly better, then that's a suggestion, okay, you're on the right track and doing more of that. But again, it's like this sort of, this exposure to pain that we've got to become a bit okay with and realize that it's not necessarily, like it's not damaging, it's not making things worse. It's like, it's, it's a sign that you, you've you've done enough <laughs> but it's that next day pain that you want to then experience 
take the lessons from and then move on. But yeah, like the important thing takeaway is, yeah, it's that like next day you really do get that feedback. Sorry. Yeah, absolutely. I just realized I had, while you were talking then that you, when you mentioned before the, the use of a massage gun, uh, it's actually not a massage gun. What, what Brad shows in there, and this is, it goes back to this concept of once you've gone through and you've done the baseline rehab, you've increased the tensile load that you can put through it. You've increased that. You've sort of got it healing right again. So we're getting that elasticity back in the tendon. This thing here we've used, and it's. It, I'm actually going to share a, a different screen. It's based on Graston's technique. I don't know if you have mm. heard of that much, but it's it's basically <laughs> this concept of sort of using these metal yeah, yeah. tools to to rub the the muscles, the tendons, whatever. But what we've used uh, this thing for, and it, it rad swears by this thing uh, now, and I, I'm pretty sure that the podcast has got a sponsorship, so we've got an affiliate link for it now. But this thing actually vibrates and heats up. So it's the same concept, but it, it, it yeah, it's, it's kind of weird. It, 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 I have to ask Rad, but it, as far, to my knowledge, it vibrates and it, and it heats up and, it's then, and then it's got this metal bar that he's using. But that was all about desensitizing the area once it's sort of healed, you know, because, and, and it's interesting. I've got this right now going on with, my, with my, my shins. You know, I had really bad shin splints back in the day when I was boxing. And it was one of the reasons why I stopped boxing because I got to a point where I just couldn't skip or run or move around very much anymore and i never really figured out how to overcome it very well now i've started to do a bit of running again just in my old age i'm, I'm mid 40s now and i like to get out and just vary my workouts and and my exercise and i do enjoy running and, and walking and things like that getting outside but i have this crazy recurrence of of, of on the inner lower leg on the shins brutal brutal pain and it's definitely come about after getting back into boxing and, and skipping a bit and to like to touch it like my girlfriend goes to give me like a, a foot massage and 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 works up the leg and just to touch it it's like oh my god you know so anyway i've been using this this tool ju just to sort of gently desensitize the area because there's no real injury there anymore like it's i've backed everything off i've strengthened the the, the calves and the and and i've done plantar and dorsiflexion all sorts of stuff like that so anyway what are your thoughts on that just quickly in closing statement yeah so the like i mean getting into that is probably like a whole another kettle of fish like when to do that when to not and that's one you really want to do like <laughs> follow professional advice and like because if you're in acute stage and you're trying to do things that desensitize when really you're just pissing it off even more is not ideal but when thinking about like how like when you go to the if you go to the physio in the past and you've had a tens machine or people who've gone through childbirth have had you know a tens machine it's a great way of reducing some pain if you put a heat pack on anything if you put an ice pack on anything they're all working on this or if you've just you know knocked your elbow and you've rubbed like you just quickly rub it to make it feel less painful. That's like, they're all working on the same mechanism of basically like, it's just overloading the area and like providing a different stimulus that then means that your brain isn't able to kind of like hone in on the the signal that was then being perceived as the pain experience. So like, it, it's all the same stuff. It's slightly like when thinking about that desensitization side of things and that Graston tool, and there was a time, cause I was a massage therapist while I was studying sports science in my post-grad physio. There was a time where I was like, oh, Graston technique, I want to go get one. Of, it looks like a, a case full of like torture implements. Um, <laughs> they're like old school Graston tools or totally. in the Eastern, Eastern medicine is like, I think it's called Guan Sha, maybe. I'm probably totally getting that wrong. But it's like these jade tools where you like do these like scraping and whatever. And they do not <laughs> do what a lot of people say they do of like remodeling my fascial like st structure. They don't do any of that. <laughs> but it, yeah, again, it can be like a useful tool of if you if you got vibration and heat, then you're going to be doing, I guess, a lot of what that like a heat pack or a, or a TENS machine is doing, which is basically just like adding a non-threatening stimulus to it. And it's also just like, when thinking about perceived threat and your brain's like understanding what's going on, if you're, and this is why a lot of like why massage is quite effective is if you're getting a stimulus on, if you're like having a controlled stimulus, particularly from someone who's expert <laughs> or from something that has a lot of like scientific backing you at, like, you know, it looks like it's really, you know, legit. If you think it, your brain then like seeing this like therapeutic touch as something beneficial and then again it's really hard to feel under threat when you're like oh this is meant to be good for me so <laughs> like yeah they can it can be actually like beneficial in just that sort of way but again it's more coming down to the 
like desensitization rather than there's no like structural change there. And that's where people can really get this wrong is thinking like that you're breaking up adhesions or doing things like that. Like you're not. <laughs> and if you're working, if you are doing things hard enough to do that, then you're probably causing more damage than, than good. So remember like line, as we've talked about through this episode and what I talked about with like my experience of giving myself the injury and then rehabbing it with the same exercises is it's all about that dosing. And you want to think like both in the, Mike, like really zoomed in what's happening at that tendon then what's happening in the system and then what's happening at your like a systemic level so you know making sure we're really prioritizing recovery and good healthy systemic information all that kind of stuff and then also what's happening in the brain like are you able to take a lot of the focus away from that elbow because people with like with injuries can and i've done this so many times get that injury identity of being so zoomed in like so focused on it and for me honestly the thing that helped me the most with my golfer's elbow was like using that injury as an opportunity to focus on something else. And I gave it to myself. <laughs> and then I was like, you know, I, I went into the rehab protocols and I found it so boring that I was like, oh, this sucks. Um, just like, you know, it, so then I shifted my focus and it was really like, once I started to get really enthusiastic and feeling my progress in my lower body strength and running, that meant that I didn't have to make like every upper body workout as do or die. It was like, you know, it was ticking along in the background and then it wasn't the big focus of like every part of exercise. Whereas if you're a rock climber or you're, you know, someone into like sports paddling or calisthenics, like if, if you're so focused on that being the thing that stops you from enjoying your life, then it's so hard. So just like do try and see every injury as an opportunity to work on something else so that you can stay motivated, keep the momentum. So that way you're keeping all the positive brain stuff. You're keeping the exercise up, which is going to help at that metabolic level. And then it's going to keep you engaged in all around strength conditioning, which is going to help at that system level. And then you're going to have like the mental space to do what you need at that local level. And the, and the habit muscle. You know, oh, yeah. <laughs> you got to flex that habit muscle. Keep going to the gym. Guys, big, big, big episode. Lots and lots and lots to digest there. If you want to take things further, please do jump on. I'll share this in the description and you can go through and take a look at the Golfer's Elbow Blueprint. And this is really a step-by-step -step guide from Rad about how he overcame his, I think he's had it a few times now, you know. And then, of course, we do have the other resource that I spoke about before, which is a video. Can I just pause on, pause on that? Just for the, the fact, like, you said he's had it a few times. And that's, like, that's okay. Like, it's it's okay to have these little injuries pop up. And, you know, you look at the condition that Rad's in. He's ripped. He's healthy. He's doing, like, great stuff in his training. And he's had these little setbacks. He's had these little injuries. And he deals with it and moves on. And that's the, the key thing that people need to take away is, like, you know, he's got really good now at at, at doing what we, t we call rehab, which is training in the presence of injury. It's not stopping everything and waiting around until everything gets better. So it's okay absolutely. to get these little niggles, just stay in the game. Yeah, absolutely. I'll, I'll link this video. <laughs> Phil was mortified to see this podcast before because he's, he's on probably 95% of our podcasts. And Rad showed a clip of one episode where his business partner, Nilesh, our previous business partner, was in the podcast studio, <laughs> not him. Oh, what a stab in the I mean, back. So many of were both there. And then, yeah, <laughs> I know, I know. It's hilarious. It's <laughs> hilarious. Anyway, I'll link this video. It's a really in-depth video that goes into it. I'll also link the Golfer's Elbow Blueprint. You can get access to that. And otherwise, guys, yeah, look, let's just... Thank everyone for getting this far. Let us know in the comments if there's anything we missed, if there's anything you would like us to have covered or... Completely different topic. Let us know in the comments. Give the video a like or give the podcast a like if you haven't already and subscribe to the channel or the podcast. Phil can be found at philwhitephysio.me or philwhite.me actually. And of course, we can always be found at unitygym.com. And, you know, Phil's also available on socials at philwhitephysio. And you can get me, I'm, I'm just Yanni Bormeister, my regular name, but also at Unity Gym, of course, you'll get Rad and I. Thank you very much, guys. Well done for making it this far. If you have, of all the uh, content you could be watching and digesting, you've chosen to spend your time with us, improving your health. And I think that's a really, really powerful thing to do. Uh, we'll be back again next week and we'll either be continuing this topic or we'll be on a, another topic based on your feedback. So get your comments in. Thank you, Phil. Always a pleasure. See ya.